scholars of Earth and environmental science. Today, we will be learning about earthquakes. We'll be learning about their causes, the types of waves they emit, how scientists measure the distance to the epicenter, and the magnitude of earthquakes. Then we'll conclude with a discussion of how earthquakes and tsunamis affect society. So first of all, let's answer the question, why do we care? Well, the main way, earthquakes are the main way that we feel the effects of plate tectonics. Earthquakes also allow us to learn more about the dynamics of Earth's geosphere. And because of their destructive capability, it's important to prepare ourselves. And just like volcanoes, people connect earthquakes to the divine. They both often represent the wrathful nature of the gods. For example, in the novel Candide by Voltaire, the characters experience an earthquake which devastated the city of Lisbon in 1755. There is a picture of it in the center here. And seismologists estimate that this earthquake had a magnitude in the neighborhood of 8.5 to 9.0. Very, very big earthquake. And it resulted in the deaths of 10 to 100,000 people. To Voltaire, this earthquake, with no reasonable justification, represented a sign from an indifferent or cruel god. But if we're taking a scientific approach to earthquakes, we first need to define them. We can define earthquakes as a sudden release of energy in the form of waves, which travel through earth and shake the ground. These earthquakes start at a point along a fault where there is a break in the crust. So let's take a moment to stop and think. Please go to this website here and take a couple of minutes uh, to look at this map of all the earthquakes occurring today. Make notes about where they occur and how many occur at each magnitude. So first let's talk about some terms related to the anatomy of earthquakes. The focus, also known as the hypocenter, is a point underground at a fault where the earthquake starts. Hypo is a root meaning below, such as the word hypodermic needles, which go below our skin. Now faults come in all sizes. If you break open a small rock with a hammer and see disturbed layers, that's an example of a fault. On the other hand, the boundaries of plates are the biggest faults. Now, if you draw a line from the focus to the surface of the ground, you get to the epicenter, which is a point directly above the focus. Epi is another root meaning above or upon, such as the word epitome, which is just the greatest example of something. Now we'll talk a bit about the forces occurring at faults and why earthquakes happen. So we need to discuss stress. And in this context, stress is a force acting on a surface. This could be tension, which is pulling, compression, pushing, or shear stress, where objects slide against each other. Stresses can cause objects to deform, depending on their properties. Consider a spring. If you pull on it and apply a tension stress, it will begin to stretch out. If you only stretch it out a little big, a, a little bit, the spring will return to its original state. This is called elastic deformation. Much like the elastic in your stretchy sweatpants, this type of deformation is reversible. However, if you keep stretching out the spring, it might not quite return to where it started from. It may be permanently elongated in a process called plastic deformation. Eventually, if you keep exerting higher stresses on any material, they will eventually break. Very brittle materials, like ceramics, that coffee mugs are made of, might not even go through the plastic stage. They might just suddenly fracture. In the case of rocks experiencing stress, we see these deformations as faults. Under shear stress, which happens at transform boundaries where plates slide horizontally past each other, we get a strike-slip fault. Under tension, which happens at divergent boundaries where plates spread apart, we get a normal fault. There, we see the foot wall ends up at a higher level than the hanging wall. Under compression, which happens at convergent boundaries, 
this is where plates collide, we get the opposite. A reverse fault happens there. In this case, the hanging wall ends up on top. And again, faults don't have to occur just at boundaries. They can happen within plates themselves. Now, both plastic and elastic deformation are capable of storing energy, but it's theorized that the elastic rebounding process causes earthquakes. As plates interact with each other, they don't just smoothly slide past. Their jagged edges get stuck on each other and apply a force of friction. These massive forces stretch out the rock and store increasing amounts of energy. Eventually, the rock ruptures and the plates release all of this elastic energy in an instant. The rock pushes out and then suddenly retracts back in, thus moving nearby material, which in turn moves other nearby material. This pulse of vibration moves away from the focus as a wave. Meanwhile, the rock at the origin has moved from where it was originally. We can see this disturbance because often fences are separated or parts of the seafloor are exposed due to earthquakes. So this process was a little bit complicated. So I'd like you to take a moment to summarize it in your own words. Please rewind the video if you need to hear it again. So scientists who study earthquakes are called seismologists. The ancestor of the modern earthquake detectors was invented in China by an inventor named Zhang Heng in the second century. This apparatus could measure which direction an earthquake came from when metal balls dropped from the mouths of dragons into frogs, as seen here. The early seismographs the tool used to measure earthquakes was invented in the early 1900s. A heavy weight was attached to a pen, which drew lines on a rotating drum attached to the base of the mechanism. So when the earth shook, the drum would move, but the pen would stay in the same place due to inertia, an object's, op an object's tendency to stay in its initial state. I like to think about inertia like waking up. You would much rather continue to sleep, so it takes quite a bit of effort to get out of bed. Now, modern seismographs electronically encode this information using digital signals that are produced whenever you change the voltage within a capacitor. Either way, these outputs of seismographs are called seismograms. Just like a telegraph, produces a signal which we read as a telegram. Seismograms allow us to find out when an earthquake affected the station, what types of waves hit it, and how strong the quake was. We see this picture below shows a seismogram from the 1964 Alaska quake, which registered a magnitude of 9.2. The very exaggerated height just shows just how powerful this quake was. Now, seismographs show us that earthquakes rarely occur in just a single pulse. Often, earthquakes are preceded by a foreshock, which is a small quake occurring before a larger main shock. After this main shock, smaller quakes, known as aftershocks, with gradually diminishing strength, can still affect people. These aftershocks can continue days after the main earthquake. Now, I'd like you to stop and think again. Seismographs have also given us insight into the different types of waves created by earthquakes. I'd like for you to take a moment to go to this website here and look at animations of each type of wave. Make some observations about how the particles simulating the earth behave before, during, and after the wave passes through them. So earthquake waves occur in four types, which can be categorized as either surface waves or body waves. Surface waves, as the name suggests, travel along the surface of the earth. These move the slowest and cause the most destruction. 
The reason for surface waves' destructive potential is because while Rayleigh waves shake the ground in a circular motion, love waves also shake the ground side to side. This greatly damages the foundation of buildings and can lead to their collapse. Body waves, however, travel through the earth. Primary waves, also known as P waves, are a lot like sound waves in that they vibrate material back and forth. These travel the fastest, so they are the first waves to be detected on a seismogram. They can also travel through all types of material, but when they collide with the liquid inner Earth's core, or sorry, the liquid outer Earth's core, they refract and change their direction. This is just like how light waves bend when they go through a glass of water, distorting the shape of a straw. Meanwhile, secondary or shear waves, also known as S waves, are more like a drum which can vibrate up and down. Those move material perpendicular at right angles to the direction of the wave's motion. These are slightly slower than P waves, so they will arrive after, but they will still arrive before the surface waves. Unlike P waves, liquids are incapable of transmitting S waves, so they cannot pass through the molten outer core. These properties of body waves help to explain why some areas known as shadow zones cannot detect P or S waves. Also, careful observation of P waves traveling through the core of the Earth helped the Danish scientist Inga Lehmann to theorize that the core was not entirely molten, as people thought at the time. Instead, she realized that the Earth had a solid center inner core. Now, take a moment, and now that we're familiar with the different types of waves, try to create a method that we could use to measure how far an earthquake epicenter is from the detector. Think about what you would need to measure and how you could infer the location from those measurements. The key method scientists use to find the distance to an epicenter relies on the difference in speed between P and S waves. If we measure the difference in their arrival times on a seismogram and know their speeds, we can calculate how far they must have traveled. However, this alone doesn't tell you where the epicenter is. One measurement from one station can only give you a circle of infinite possibilities. Adding a second measurement would create a second circle, so the epicenter would have to be at their intersection, one of two points. Adding a third measurement nails down the location. This process is called triangulation, and a similar idea is used by GPS systems to locate where you are based on the time taken for microwaves to travel to and from satellites. So if waves moved at constant speed, the distance calculation would be very easy. Unfortunately, as earthquake waves get farther from the air epicenter, they dissipate their energy and slow down. So in order to calculate the distance, we need to use a travel time graph. But before that, we must first read the seismogram. Prior to the earthquake, we see the line moving very little. But then we see the first pulse, which represents the arrival of the P wave. Again, it arrives first because it travels the fastest. For a brief moment, the seismogram returns to the original level before it is interrupted by the arrival of the slightly slower S wave and the subsequent surface waves. We can measure the time from when the P waves first arrived to when the S waves first arrived. This is the SP time interval. The key trend here is that the closer the epicenter is to the seismograph station, the P and S waves would have not separated very much, so the time interval would be shorter. Now with this, we can go to our travel time graph. On the x-axis is the distance traveled by the waves from the epicenter, usually in kilometers. 
and on the y-axis is the time taken by the wave in minutes. The S wave curve is higher because for the same distance, it will take longer to arrive than the P wave. Now, we're interested in the distance between the curves, which represents the SP time interval. All we have to do is find where that difference in height matches the time interval that we found on the seismogram. After that, all we have to do is draw a line down to the x-axis and read off the distance. If we combine this with measurements from two other seismograph stations, this will tell us the location of our epicenter. Now that we have a method for finding the distance to the epicenter, we should develop a method for finding the strength or power of the earthquake. So take a few moments and think of the different factors that we should account for. So, there are two ways that we can measure the impact of earthquakes. After the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, a scientist named Giuseppe Mercalli developed the intensity scale. This subjective scale depends on how an earthquake impacts people and buildings. So Roman numeral I, which means one, means that a quake is felt by nobody. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Roman numeral XII for 12 means that a quake causes total destruction and the waves themselves are visible. And while this scale is easy to conceptualize, the Mercalli scale has a downside. The same earthquake could have different intensities at different locations, even if they're the same distance from the epicenter. And this could happen if the locations use different materials or building methods. A more objective scale must try to measure the magnitude of the quake, how much energy it releases. And Charles Richter tried to do just that with his scale created in 1935. This method uses the distance from the epicenter and height of the seismogram's waves to calculate a magnitude. This should lead to consistent measurements of magnitude for the same earthquake. Because earthquakes release energy over many orders of magnitude, the scale has to be logarithmic or exponential, meaning that each increase of one in magnitude corresponds to a tenfold increase in shaking or a 32-fold increase in the amount of energy released. So earthquakes with a magnitude less than one occur very frequently, or often continuously. That's why we get the noise on our seismogram. Massive earthquakes, though, are more rare, but they release massive amounts of energy. For example, the largest earthquake in human history occurred in 1960 off the coast of Chile and clocked in at a magnitude 9.5. This one earthquake alone is responsible for releasing a quarter of all the seismic energy released from every earthquake from 1906 to 2005. Unfortunately, even the Richter scale still has some issues. With very large earthquakes, or those that occur deep down, different seismic stations calculate different magnitudes. The more modern moment magnitude scale fixes this problem by directly calculating how much energy is released in the earthquake. If plates are more rigid, displace a longer distance, or the quake affects a larger surface area, then the total energy released will increase. Multiplying these factors calculates the moment, which can be plugged into a formula to find the magnitude. So now that we have some methods to quantify information about earthquakes, it's important to think about how earthquakes can affect people and what we can do to mitigate their impact. Take a few moments to think about these questions and jot down your thoughts. Now, besides the destruction of the waves themselves, earthquakes can cause a variety of knock-on effects. For example, 
the shaking of the ground can result in something called liquefaction, where the solid dirt is vibrating so quickly it effectively becomes a liquid. This can undermine and lead to the collapse of buildings, especially if they are not secured in the ground or if they're built out of flimsy materials. In addition, earthquakes can trigger landslides where a huge mass of rock and dirt falls down a slope. This is called an avalanche if snow is the main thing falling. Both of these are particularly destructive to structures as they carry tremendous energy, which can impact and destroy buildings. Earthquakes can also rupture pipes, resulting in gas leaks and potential fires. Or as happened in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, firefighters were unable to put these fires out quick enough because the water lines had been broken. Now, if earthquakes occur underwater, this can cause a tsunami, a giant wave which can be tens of meters high. This can devastate coastal areas and wash away people and building debris. Tsunamis often happen at convergent boundaries, when the subducting plate bends the overlying plate to a point where the elastic energy is released in an earthquake. This concusses the water above and creates a wave which goes out in all directions. Now, in deep water, tsunamis will travel very quickly, but their waves aren't very tall. When they reach shallower waters, all that energy is then compressed, so the wave height increases. Tsunami translates to harbor wave in Japanese because they don't appear until they are very close to shore. One of the most infamous tsunamis in recent memory occurred in 2011 as a result of a 9.0 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Japan. Besides causing the deaths of over 10,000 people and the displacement of a couple hundred thousand, this led to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant meltdown. And while a seawall had been constructed to block sea level surge, it was overwhelmed by the massive tsunami. The backup pumps built below sea level were knocked out by the wave. And when the main pumps failed, the reactor was left with no way to cool itself. The fission chain reaction continued to increase the temperature of the fuel in the surrounding zirconium steel alloy cladding. This reacted with the water to produce large amounts of hydrogen gas. At some point, this gas was detonated to blow off the sealing containment, revealing the top of the reactor vessel, as shown in the picture below. Left uncooled, the fuel and the cladding material melted, releasing large amounts of radioactivity. This case study demonstrates the danger of earthquakes and tsunamis and the need to be prepared. Due to the danger, it might seem like a good idea to try and figure out when earthquakes might happen. This is tricky business due to the seemingly random motion of the plates and the unpredictable nature of when elastic rebound would occur. In the short term, predicting earthquakes is basically impossible. In the long term, some scientists think that it is possible to use seismic gaps to predict which areas are due for an earthquake in the near future, although this method is controversial and not universally accepted. Based on the assumption that along the same fault, each area should experience about the same amount and intensity of earthquakes. So if a particular zone has not had an earthquake for a while, a big earthquake might happen there soon. Now, it's important to warn people ahead of time that an earthquake is coming so that people can prepare themselves. Although false alarms can cause panic among the general public and disturb people's lives. So the best way to mitigate the harmful effects of earthquakes is to carefully construct buildings, providing reinforcement in the walls through cross bracing and shear walls lessens the impact of the shaking. In addition, creating shock absorbers in the foundation, these are very strong springs, those help to absorb energy from the earthquakes. And finally, 
particularly tall buildings like Taipei 101, depicted here, use mass dampeners to protect from earthquakes. Their large mass gives the building inertia to resist moving away from a state of rest. So this is everything I have about earthquakes today. In the description, I have posted some links to other great videos about earthquakes. I hope this was helpful. Next time, we'll begin our unit on the hydrosphere and how oceans and river systems interact. Cheers!